that I'm fond of on this particular style of bowl. Now, on the bowls that we're doing, are we actually going to be using the glazes over there? Or are we oh, well, if you put high fire there. glaze on that low fire clay and you put it in the high fire kiln, we'll, we'll all be disappointed Boom. because okay. your bowl will melt and flow on the shelf. <laughs> well, I'm using high fire clay too, so that's the reason why I am. Okay. So, so that's one style, different style of foot than the piece that Trevor's holding. I got interested in a different shaped bowl, one that had a little bit more gestural expressiveness to it. And when I began to trim that, I realized I needed a different foot solution. So I ripped off the one that Ann Herb was doing. Like the, um, I like the indentation. Yeah, the design on it. Yeah, the, the, uh, those, these are really wonderful to, to hold. <laughs> Great coffee mug. <laughs> Cappuccino mug. So how did you do the wrap? <laughs> uh, I don't really have a piece here where that was appropriate, but it's it's all. I mean, it's the same amount of clay down there. It's what. You, Oh, like how do you get the red? Right, you just you carve as a trimming. I'm gonna have to show you. I, I can. I'll, I'll try to figure out a piece that I can show you. Okay. Well, you can do it another day as well. Do you need help? David's gonna go straight, I think. Yeah, there's a thing of water. This we just set over here. Oh, I see. It got that was out of the way and it got moved back. What else we got? Ginger pot. Mm -hmm. no. But it's a particular kind of relationship where it curves in at the foot and then it goes out like this. So that's that's that tradition. Here's one that you know I love having it at home. It got broken chip before it ever got through the kiln. That's the chopsticks. And then, and then here's one where the bottom, it's a, a flat bottom piece, and so the bottom of the form ends up being reflected with a flat bottom foot. <laughs> Yeah, I think that this was back in the, uh, the day of the French onion soup with the bread on top kind of thing. And yeah, this, this is one of two. Actually, the other one got broken last week. Um, I, I found these two at an antique store in San Luis Obispo, so I bought them back for the same price I sold them for originally. <laughs> We're going to set them all over here. So you found it an antique store? Those are all done, so we're going to start. I mean, no, no, I mean, the, the term antique is abused all the time. A contemporary version of thrift store, at a, a higher end thrift store might be a more appropriate. But I, so when I, when I find my friend's pottery, I buy the pieces and give them back to them. What they call it vintage? I, well, I suppose, I suppose they do that. Yeah. Bill Shin used to say it was disheartening to find his pieces at yard sales. <laughs> yeah, I would love to find to great them. customers, and they would buy my pots and give them as, as business gifts all the time. And then my mom started finding the business gifts in the thrift stores around Marin County, and decided it was time to stop giving them away. I know. So do you miss your studio practice? Sure. You know, if you spent 20 years measuring you, the success of your efforts by unloading the kiln, then there's a hole in my heart that I inherited as soon as I started teaching. And maybe once every three or four years, I get together enough bisque on the shelves up there that if I don't glaze stuff, it's going to fall off an earthquake. So, uh, so then I come in and spend five days glazing a load and firing it and, and get the thrill again. Is the majority of that yours? 
But not these shelves, the, the distant shelves. Oh, okay. Back in the glaze room. All the stuff. It's quite a collection up there. He's hogging up the space back. <laughs> that is nice. And it does look like a Prince William suit thing. Mm -hmm. No, I want the Yeah, it's like, oh. but like with a bread bowl yeah. and cheese on top. When you when you take your pieces and move them into the damp room, at some point you're going to want to do it. Remember, we cut them off right at the time they were thrown, right. and therefore they're going to begin to dry, and they'll finally shrink enough they pop off. That's going to leave a thin layer of clay on the back. Do I have your attention? That's going to leave a thin layer of clay on the bat, which will be also leather hard. This is a very inexpensive paint scraper. It doesn't cost much to have several of these in your toolkit. And they're wonderful for scraping off that leather hard layer of clay so that the bat can be put back on the shelf instead of set up there with a layer of dry cracked clay, which is really time-consuming to clean up. One of the things that I find most distressing is when I start to work and I begin my work process by cleaning up after somebody else's work process. I think a very thoughtful and appropriate way to be part of the ceramics community here at Hancock is that not only do you take care of your own supplies and materials and your tools, you take care of the ones you borrow from the studio. So clean up the bats and then put them away. Don't leave them uh, to dry and then expect someone else to cover up your mess. These, there are, we have several varieties of bats. These are made of sawdust and glue. If they soak in water, they begin to absorb water and they begin to break down. So we never want to lay them in water. You may want to sponge them off and that's fine. But people who've left them and then they have dry clay, the easiest way to get rid of the dry clay is let that lay face down in the water and then wipe dry clay gets wet and it wipes off, but it begins to cause the bats to decompose. So if you do that when it's leather hard, it's really pretty nice. And I thought about not doing it when I wrapped these up because, as I said, I had these out in the studio, and then on Wednesday, I, Tuesday night, I put them away with plastic over them, and on Wednesday, I brought them out, wrapped them all up so that they'd be ready for trimming today. Okay. Passing it around for you to evaluate the thickness. Ooh. Okay, so let me reframe, rephrase my question. Okay. The ones that we're doing here. You're, you're doing low fire glazes. Okay. We can do under glazes. Yeah, and you can use under glazes as well. Is that useful to be able to sort of calibrate? Yeah. I know when you look at it, you really don't know what you're looking at. <laughs> yeah. The way you find out is to, uh, to get your hands on it. And remember that if it's made like that, there's got to be a lot of clay out there to support those walls. That shape, when something sticks out in space, that's called a cantilever, structurally. And it takes a lot of clay to support that or the whole thing will say. The beauty of working with low fire clay is it doesn't get soft in the kiln. It doesn't shrink in the firing and it has great stability. So I can trim a much more severe foot under that piece than I can if I do the same form with high fire clay where because of the vitrification and the shrinkage that happens and the softening of the clay during the firing, I end up with a piece sagging. So I could make the foot much narrower in low fire than I could in high fire. On a wide piece like this, I can get away with even less preparation. So, 
first step is I always set the outside diameter of the foot and then begin to trim away this excess clay. During the years of being at home in the backyard making pots and having three children, as you can imagine, it was not unusual that the kids would come into the studio while I was working. And one of those, my middle child, Michelle, used to love to have me do this. <laughs> it's like toothpaste. <laughs> And she would sit there beside me and let that, that ribbon of clay run right through that. And she just thought that was so cool. Glad she was going. And, <laughs> <laughs> and one of those one of those times I had recycled buckets like this, right over here where all that all the scrap clay would go. And I turned around and she'd taken off her clothes and she was in the clay bucket. <laughs> Does she throw clay now? <laughs> no, she's a she's a yoga teacher in Santa Barbara. She did a career as a professional dancer in Europe before then. And she got tired of the emotional chill of Scandinavia, so she decided to come home to California and family and warmth, and did so by way of India, where she met a guy from Santa Barbara in a yoga ashram, and they trained together, and they now are parents of twin grandsons, my grandsons, their sons, ten years old. Now she calls and says, Dad, will you do clay camp? And they come up for a week and I set up an outdoor studio for the boys and we make stuff. And mm -hmm. Like grandpas are supposed to do, you know. Yeah. If they were girls, they'd be in, in, the, in the kitchen with Grandma making cookies. Not necessarily. Not in, not in my family. They'd be out in the studio with me. Yeah. <laughs> come on. I spent time out in the shop with my grandfather when he was doing woodwork or machine work. My grandfather used to take us out. <laughs> Hunting? Hunting, yeah. Too much water is always too much water. Let's slide around. There we go. I meant to bring a towel. I'm going to borrow somebody's here. Breaking all the rules. I told you if you wanted a towel, bring your own. So, one of my functional considerations is always to round off those edges so they're much less likely to chip and they're more durable not only in the process in the studio but also after they're out of the studio. Well, the Kemper Clay Company and all the knockoff companies around them make tools Sometimes the most important tools are the ones that you make for yourself to meet a particular need. So I, I happen to uh, have a great fondness for sushi. And on Wednesdays, I stay here and uh, to fire the high fire kiln to finish the firing. 
and so on. Every Wednesday night you could find me if you were searching for me at Atari Yacht. And, and I would bring home two chopsticks at the end of the evening, which would serve many purposes. Here's another side of that storyline, is that when you're doing your work, if you don't lose some portion of your work in the process, then you might be working too safely. If you're not pushing the boundaries of your competence, of your skill and your experience, So I, when I'm at work, if I, don't, if I don't lose about every tenth piece, either through distraction or by pushing it out too thin or any number of, I'll find out that I'm, I'm working more carefully than, than I am in terms of managing my own growth and development. Um, I also find that when I throw pieces in these demonstration environments where I split attention, the pieces are always heavier than I would prefer. It's just a byproduct of, I'm not here to show you how to not succeed. So here's how to be safe. And, okay, I, the one on the uh, bat. This one? That one. So I didn't cut this one off. I mean red, or thank you. Yeah, David snores too much during our ceramics three lectures. Got some bit of pinch up, so <laughs> He was awake now. He heard you. My dog goes now. I have a dog that snores too. It's the only way I know he's asleep. <laughs> gentle press here, a firm press usually finds the inside, but a gentle press will reveal if the foot area is getting too thin. For most of you, the, the concept of what you've watched happen here is not too difficult to grasp. There's a, just like centering, there's a lot to it that you can't know until you try, until you struggle with it, and then you can begin to process the information. Um, so I, I caution you just to remember that anything that I'm doing here is a re reflection of 47 years of working with clay. And so some of it might be more graceful than you experienced the first time you try it. <laughs> the shades don't even come close. <laughs> Now most of these underglazes and glazes ask for two to three coats. Are you going to go back and put another coat on, no, or this will is it a be a much thicker coat than if I was brushing it? Oh, okay. And and the second thing about that is the um, 
by virtue of, of applying the coating while the piece is rotating, even if it's a bit thin, it will have sort of a swirling character. It won't look like crosshatched, um, ugly brush strokes. And when you're removing clay, you're doing a moisture layer that the the color of these stick to you better than if you just... Yes, yes, that's my experience, is that little dampening on the surface was a, creating a, a better connection. Amberly, would you be kind enough to wash that? I haven't done this today, but sometimes I'll throw cups that have kind of undulating rims, and so they won't sit on the wheel. So what, instead what I'll do is I'll center a mound of clay, slightly larger than this, and I'll just position this on that soft mound of clay. You're not worried that the clay will sit on the No, it, if, if, if it does, it's usually insignificant. Now if you were going to do a cut you. with a mug, would you put the underglaze on before the handle or afterwards? Well, since next week, the first thing I'll be doing with you is putting handles on these pieces. Okay. Well. Be self -evident. So you're going to keep these in the damp room you can yes. till next week then? Stay, I should. 